Thanks for stopping by for this week's Songs to Chew podcast. I am Peter Alsop, and today we'll listen to a song I recorded back in 1977. It was written by a young man in New York City named Bob Abrams. It's about a Native American World War II veteran. His story was like that of many, many other indigenous Americans. With our current spotlight on the racism and racial injustice in our country, I thought it would be good to chew on this song for a bit, and I wanted to listen to it again, too, after 43 years. So, here from my Draw the Line album is our song for today, Way High. In the South Dakota summer sun in 1925 I was born the son of a Sioux and his wife I was barely, just barely alive Yeah, the midwife, she slapped my red behind I opened my lungs and cried and How many times have I cried to myself And wished that that infant had died Way high, my spirit's not dying But it sleeps on the prairie with no place to go Walk and talk. It's too late for me, but my children must know. For Fifteen years I went on the road from a distance of time I could see. My father insane and my brothers in chains and my tribe not much different than me. And I served in the Air Force nigh on four years in Berlin I was treated okay but back in Dakota the Germans have homes where engines no longer can stay way high my spirit's not dying but it sleeps on the prairie with no place to go way high wake up walk and talk it's too late for me but my children must know I was married, fought to raise kids, but my children could not be for me. By the church they were raised, and by Jesus were saved from an ignorant savage like me. But they're learning in Taos to stand on their own, they're learning in Alcatraz. Our children will teach us, our spirits will lead us fight as we did in the past way high my spirit's not dying but it sleeps on the prairie with no place to go way high wake up walk and talk it's too late for me but my children must know way high my spirit's not dying but it sleeps on the prairie with no place to go For me, but my children must know. Our musicians are my old friends, Michelle Browman on piano, Peter Spellman on bass, and Tim Boatman on drums, with the wonderful Helen Hudson and Bob Millard on background vocals. I play guitar and harmonica, and all of us, I believe, identify as non-native white folks. So for some reason, the words cultural appropriation popped into my mind. Do you all know what that is? Here's the definition I pulled off of the internet. Cultural appropriation is the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, etc. of one people or society by members of another, and typically more dominant people or society. Well, let's see. I was about 30 years old. This was my third album, part live and part studio recording. And in retrospect, I think there was definitely cultural appropriation going on. This song was not specifically about me or my culture, other than my cultural white cluelessness about these things. I didn't know much about Native cultures back then, but I was curious and wanted to know more. 
I did feel a little strange because the song touched me so deeply when I first heard it. And even though I knew the song was written by a Jewish white guy, I also knew in my bones that this was a true story. It was also powerful to hear it related as it might have been sung firsthand by a World War II Native American veteran. It opened the door for me to feel a taste of the relentless, never-ending heavy rain of injustices and pain from the sadness of the life he described. I fought to raise kids, but my children could not be for me. By the church they were raised and by Jesus were saved from an ignorant savage like me. I felt so angry about that. And as a young man in the 60s, I resonated with the desire to fight back against the systems of oppression which were manifesting themselves for me too, in the form of the war in Vietnam, the slaughter and vilification of the Black Panthers, the killings of Medgar Evers, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, and thousands of others since then. I was also aware of the constant legal harassment of the American Indian Movement's co-founders, Russell Means and Dennis Banks, for speaking out about the injustices and plight of Native Americans in this country. And I love that this man knows it may not happen in his lifetime, but he sees hope as his people stand up for themselves in Taos and on Alcatraz Island. And he knows that in the future, our children will teach us, our spirits will lead us to fight as we did in the past. As an actor at the time, it didn't occur to me when I delivered lines like, the midwife, she slapped my red behind, or the Germans had homes where engines no longer can stay, that they might be less than politically correct for a white man to sing. If it had occurred to me, I might have tried to find a person of native descent to sing with me or harmonize or something, because the story told in this song was a tale that needed to be told and heard. The general awareness of what was going on for Native Americans in our country was not taught in our history books, and it was certainly not getting much traction with our predominantly white culture in the 60s and 70s. Actually, it's only just recently got any traction at all in these first few months of this 2020 summer, 50 years later. And that's been largely due to the Black Lives Matter movement and the new awareness in our predominant culture of the prevalence of police violence against people of color. And now, finally, the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision came down to say that a large portion of eastern Oklahoma remains tribal land because Congress never explicitly disestablished the 1866 boundaries of the Muskegee Creek Nation. The decision was hailed as a win for tribal sovereignty, but the struggle to end racism and for each of us to appreciate the diversity of our land's indigenous people is far from being over. Long before us, the indigenous Maori people of New Zealand managed to get the British Empire to honor their treaty agreements by getting tribal members into the British law schools and then into the courts as lawyers and judges. The British government did not honor treaties they signed with their Maori people. Whenever indigenous people fight back with force, the usually much larger colonizing forces win and continue to ignore and subjugate the native people. The Maori have won many of their court battles, and that has helped them find more justice, as they too still have to stand against the racism that exists in New Zealand and indeed worldwide. So we can do what we can with what we have to make the world a better, kinder, harder place for all of us. And of course, we each need to keep learning. We know we need to change ourselves if we're going to have a more caring and kind-hearted society. It starts with us. I'm glad you stopped by. I'm Peter Alsop. We'll be back next week with another song to chew. Find me on Facebook at We Like Peter Alsop or email me at peter at peteralsop.com. I'd love to hear any of your thoughts or suggestions. My new album, Camping with Dads, ta-da, has finally come out. You can find it on Google Play. Stay safe. See you next week. <laughs>